Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I am pleased to be joined by not one, not two, but three guests today on this last episode before we move into our 2022 year in review series tomorrow. And all three candidates have something in common. They are all running for the Green Party of Alberta here in Calgary. I'm going to do a roundtable introduction, and then I'll get them to say their names. So that way, for those who are listening to this uh, via audio, they will know the names to the uh, voices. So running in Calgary Hayes, we have Evelyn Tanaka. Running in Calgary Curry, we have Jonathan Parks. And running in Calgary Edgemont, we have Randy Kincaid. Evelyn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having us, Chris. It's an honor to be on your show and to spread the green message and tell you a little bit more about us. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Chris, it's a pleasure. So happy to be here and uh, hanging out with all of you guys here again. And Brandy, welcome to your first time on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I'm excited to do my first interview on behalf of the Green Party as well. Oh, hey, I, I always like when that's said to me on the show. Um, I'm going to start my line of questions with the exact question I open up with all my political guests. So all three of you are no exceptions. Evelyn, you've already had this question, so you're going to be last. So I'm going to start with Brandy. Brandy, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, that's a great question. So I was never super interested in politics as a young girl. I became interested when I was doing my PhD in fuel cells. And uh, so I started my PhD back in 2010 now. And uh, it, it was sad to see how the excitement for fuel cells completely dwindled off simply because of policy change in politics in the US and in Canada. And so I really got exploring things more and got really involved in the policy side. I reached out to a contact through my science network and he was running for the Green Party of Ontario. So that was Phil DeLuca. And uh, he had lots of good things to say about Ev and the momentum that was building in the GPA. And he introduced me to Ev. I joined the policy team last summer. So in 2021, became a little bit more involved. Jordan asked if I would be interested in running for nomination and filling a deputy leader position. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. And I really like what GPA is doing and the principles they have and what they can bring to Alberta's political landscape. We'll talk about some of the principles a little bit later in the interview, but I want to go over to Jonathan. Jonathan, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, yeah, another uh, great question, Chris. Um, as you know from our last interview, uh, I was a lot. I was really involved with uh, the nonprofit sector and getting involved in volunteering, community work, and and such. And I guess it just evolved, continuously evolved. And you know, working with a lot of nonprofits, I I realized the enormity and how difficult it was. Uh, all the work that goes into nonprofit to have to you know, kind of battle with the government. Didn't seem to be a lot of voices there that were really caring about some of the major issues on the streets and and uh, just with different demographics, you know. And uh, so I felt like we needed some more voices on the inside of just the regular average Joes and, and Janes. And uh, so here, you know, I decided to get involved. And basically it kind of started where uh, you know, working through the uh, the Alberta Human Association and some of the things that we were really caring about and we'd love to see changed. And it wasn't really talked about, even though, like, from the government perspective, um, even though I was even involved with different political parties over the last number of years. So, uh, you know, not just not being happy with some of the, uh, the experiences I've had, I kind of just didn't really, I wasn't sure if I should get further involved, but um, somebody for, that I had known uh, had told me, you know, you should really connect with uh, uh, Jordan Wilkie from the Green Party. Uh, Ontario has, you know, really taken up some of the, you know, the core issues facing a lot of the stuff that we're working towards. And the Green Party uh, really cares a lot about, uh, you know, uh, the, the issues that we do. So I reached out to Jordan and uh, through the, the Facebook uh, page and had a great dialogue. And I wasn't sure if I really wanted to step, you know, forehead deep 
Uh, in the political side, uh, there was a little bit of work I had done, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, with some political parties, but not as, in, as intense. So uh, I decided to just check it out. I'm a two feet in or a two feet out. So I threw my two feet in. Uh, great conversations with uh, Evelyn and Brandy and, and Jordan and Najib and loved what I was hearing and wanted to be a part of it. So I jumped on board. I think this is not a, I, I, I think I can say this, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong here, Jonathan, but the first event you attended for the Green Party of Alberta was at the Calgary Library. And I think you and I sat side by side. And I think I looked at you and you looked at me when you said you were from Ontario. I was like, we're from Ontario. So that's how the small world we are here in Calgary, even though it seems we're vast, we are small and connected. So thank you so much for that. True. So um, true. Evelyn, now we I've already asked you this question, but I'm going to change it up a little bit here for you, because you, for those who want, they can go back and listen to Evelyn's first interview with the Canadian Greens. You, you've decided to put your name forward for the Alberta, the Green Party of Alberta. What, where did your sense of duty provincially come to serve? Yeah, so I think you know a bit about my backstory with the federal Greens and how I jumped in in 2019 and felt compelled to give people in my riding a chance to vote green. Um, I still feel like I have more to give, particularly in a coaching and mentorship role with a lot of our Green Party of Alberta candidates, um, especially ones that are running for the first time. Um, it's really fun for me to expand what I know about politics, particularly at the provincial level, and just continue leaning into this journey that I'm on. Um, so I will be on the ballot for Calgary Hayes, my home constituency. Um, and I appreciate any volunteer help for everything from putting up signs to door knocking. Um, I just can't wait to get out and start talking to people in Calgary Hayes and listening to their stories and finding those common threads and those themes that continually come up for Albertans. I'm going to ask a question that anyone can take this uh, first off if they want. Um, I, it's great that I have three people from the exact same party here because your diff, your answer to this question is going to be very different, hopefully, if not the same. What does the Green Party of Alberta mean to you? Why did you choose the Green Party? Because if I go ask someone in Lethbridge and I go ask someone in Calgary and go ask someone in Fort McMurray, they're all going to say what drew them to the Green Party or what the Green Party stands for. So for you three, what does the Green Party of Alberta stand for and why did it draw you to them? Why did it draw you to them? Yeah. Jonathan, Brandy, Evelyn, who wants to take this first? Yeah, I can definitely comment a bit on that. Um, the Green Party means to me, um, having, you know, voted in and, you know, uh, the Liberal Party, the Conservative Party, the NDP, I would call the Green Party the party of the gaps. You know, uh, being a part of some of these other parties, um, there were a lot of things missing. There were a lot of things that I brought up that I really cared about. And you know, it became a partisan issue. Oh, you know, those things are really important to people. But if we make it a, you know, a policy or a platform or a campaign thing, we could lose a different, you know, a set of demographics, despite the fact that it might actually be campaigning for a human right, you know, or something that, you know, is imperative to someone's life. And so, um, you know, I, I had touched on uh, what, uh, you know, kind of drew me to the party chatting with Jordan and, uh, you know, some of the things that I had been doing at a nonprofit that really, uh, excite, you know, that was a driving force for me. And as I got to know the Green Party and started taking a, a more of a deeper dive into it and, and hearing the voices and the passion and the, the heart that runs this party, it's the party of the gaps. It's the party of the things that, that matter to people across this province that other parties might not touch because it could cost them votes, you know, despite the fact, like, again, a human rights issue, things that matter to people on the streets, people, things that, you know, matter to uh, Albertans across this province. So I felt like it was, you know, uh, you know, um, a coming together of all the things that matter to Albertans across and even Canadians as a whole. So I was really that when I look at the Green Party, that's what I think of. That's what it means to me that, you know, um, if, if it's something that is a human need and it's a human uh, thing that we can be in control of, uh, then they care about it. Talking about climate change, for example, 
you know, uh, the Green Party has a grasp on, you know, the, the efforts needed to, you know, to fight climate change, where the other parties, you know, if they were to, to do what's ethically right, um, would lose many voters. And I think we need to look after our planet so that we're, we're around for a long time. So that's what the party means to me. It's part of the gaps, a part of the, the, of the people that care about the things that others might be afraid to touch. Evelyn, what about yourself? And then we'll end up this question with Brandy. For sure. For me, the Greens are about our shared values, so our six green principles that guide the way we um, view the world and operate in it. Um, it also is a party of the people and the relationships. As a grassroots party, grassroots party, we are built by our members, our, by our volunteers. Um, everything that we do, we do together. And I think that is... Um, the missing piece for me that from other political parties where I never felt at home, I never felt like a sense of belonging and you don't really know that until you feel it. Um, so as an outsider to politics, as, as an outsider to most groups in general, um, I found my home with the Greens. And Brandy, what about yourself? What drew you to the Greens and what does the Green Party of Alberta mean to you? So for me, I think that Greens are one of the very few parties that really actually represent um, underrepresented individuals. And so that was a big thing for me. Um, I, I don't like the way that other parties are dealing with a lot of those issues. And I think that the Green Party is one of the few that are providing solutions that I think will produce real change. And I really do... Uh, as somebody who's worked in clean tech development for well over a decade, I'm a huge fan of clean tech, and uh, I I don't see other parties making a move towards actually pushing clean tech and making uh, Alberta and Canada leaders in new clean energy developments. I, I want to turn to May 2023, which is going to be the next election, hopefully, if Danielle Smith adheres to her word and actually calls the election for May 2023, we will be in an election. Now, you, all three of you were named candidates in early, late October, early November, if I'm not mistaken, the official press release came out saying that you were the candidates. Now, your job does not start in May 2023. Your job starts as a candidate the day you are announced as the candidate. So what are you hearing? What are you hearing from the people of your ridings? So we're going to go in or rotation again, but this time we're going to start with Evelyn. Then we're going to go to Brandy. Then we'll end with Jonathan. So Evelyn in Calgary, Hayes, you talked about how you need volunteers, but what are the issues that are facing the people with Calgary Hayes right now and the people that you're talking to? Um, what I'm hearing so far from people in Hayes is that inflation is definitely the number one issue. Um, people are worried about the cost of living, the cost of everything going up, gas, um, food. Um, I've heard stories of people having no food to eat, kids going to school hungry. Um, I think those are completely unacceptable outcomes in a, a province like Alberta that has a lot of resources and a lot of money. Um, yeah, I think that there are a lot of issues that we need are very pressing that we need to deal with very soon in a systemic way, not with Band-Aid fixes. We need to be thinking short-term Band-Aid fixes, but we also need to be thinking about how do we make our systems more resilient? How do we deal with some of these issues? Um, I think healthcare is another main issue. I know in my own personal life, I have lost family members to COVID. I have family members that are suffering from long COVID now. And these are not elderly individuals. Um, and so it's you know not something that is my story to share, um, but you know, healthcare is a huge problem. I talked to one of my neighbors um, who needed me to look after her dog in like a really big pinch. And she's like, I need to get to the hospital right now. My daughter cannot breathe. So we're like, okay, just go, don't worry. We'll get your dog. We'll look after him until whenever you need. Um, and so she, is not sure why your daughter is having these continual issues um, with breathing. They think it might be long COVID. It could be something else, um, but they're not getting, you know, they went to the hospital and had to wait. They waited in triage for, I think it was a few hours before they could even get triage. Um, and when your child cannot breathe properly, is not getting enough oxygen. That's a very, very scary and very like life and death experience. 
So I think healthcare, absolutely, we need um, we need to address major issues in healthcare, all the things that we're seeing, and not just you know Danielle Smith's goals with no roadmap of how to get there. We need policies. We need actuals. You know, how are we going to get there? I think that's what Albertans are waiting for: the roadmap and the way. Um, the other thing that I'm hearing a lot about is education. My kids go to a French immersion, so we're quite lucky. Um, and But there are some major issues with education, with um, the curriculum that's being proposed. Um, both of my kids' schools have outbreak status right now. So we are, you know, having between 10 and 15% absence due to illness. And that is really interrupting um, the learning environment. Um, I know Danielle Smith thinks masks seem to be the thing holding people back. Uh, but the continual rotation of sick kids and having to catch up on schoolwork and missing those catch up um, times is a huge problem. Um, my son is behind. We had stomach flu go through the house um, three weeks ago, and he's been kind of off and on sick um, since then. And so he's missed a bunch of school and now he's quite far behind in certain assignments. Um, so again, um, education is something else that I'm hearing about from Calgary Hayes residents that we need to deal with. Brandy, what about yourself in Calgary, Edgemont? While uh, Evelyn did talk about the three big ones that I think Albertans, are there local issues that are affecting Calgary, Edgemont residents? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of general issues that are affecting Albertans right now with rising cost of living and that inability to access housing, uh, that inability to put food on the table. And so that's something that I I'm hearing a lot about uh, Renting is a big area near where I am. So, so Edgemont's not too far from the University of Calgary. There's a lot of students in the area. And that inability to access affordable housing is really starting to affect our ability to access affordable education in Canada. And I, I see that as a, a big issue when we're not allowing uh, everybody access to full education. And on that note, I'm also seeing that from parents. Uh, my my daughter goes to a Catholic school, and I saw that in the last year alone, her music program was completely dropped because of a lack of funding into that school system. And there isn't any good solutions right now on how to solve the issue with teacher shortages. There's a degradation in our actual curriculum that we need to be addressing, and uh, I, I don't see anybody really talking about those issues. So yeah, a, a big thing that we want to see is, is controls for, for housing and costs of living. And uh, the other big thing that I'm hearing about is a lot of uh, Calgarians are concerned about the environment. We are living in a world that feels like it's on fire. And it feels like Canada isn't doing anything about it. And Alberta is not doing anything about it. And we have that ability to. We are very fortunate as a leader in so many aspects of clean development of uh of social development and of pushing things forward in north america and i feel like we're losing that position and and i know that uh i'm not the only calgarian that's concerned about that and so we really want to see a big initiative towards green jobs and, and seeing alberta continue its its position as an energy leader but for clean goods Thank you, Brandy. Jonathan, now this is kind of a weird question because your writing currently is not represented by anyone. You literally have no MLA in the Legislative Assembly after Doug Schweitzer stepped down. No, that's Karen Calgary album. Never mind, I will shut my mouth because I know what I'm talking about. So what are you <laughs> hearing from Calgary Al Calgary Curry residents? Yeah, um, uh, you know, a lot of the same things that uh, Evelyn and Brandy have already touched on, you know, inflation, education, you know, a lot of these, you know, Calgary Curie is, you know, a, a huge residential area. So there's a lot of families that are sending their kids off to school. And, you know, there's tons of absences. We've got a lot of, you know, viral infections going around, people staying home, missing classes. So that's, you know, uh, on, you know, with inflation, you know, people, you know, they're spending more, they need uh, access to medications, you know, um, children's Tylenol is hard to uh, get accessible, you know, so that's a really big concern for families. And it's, it's, 
it's, you know, delaying recovery times and then trying to get into the hospital, you know, again, with healthcare, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, they try to avoid it and see what they can do to suffer it out at home because it's a long time to wait. And it's, it's difficult, you know, to sit in a, a waiting room for such a long period of time before they can get a healthcare professional to come and take a look at their kids. So, you know, that's, that's obviously a really big one. Um, you know, a lot of families, uh, they commute to work from that area. So, you know, uh, with the rising cost of fuel, uh, you know, and upkeep in that, it becomes a lot more challenging. And so, um, you know, some have tried to resort to, you know, uh, public transportation. And uh, right now, the city, for example, has been talking about, um, you know, the Calgary transit system and the potential extra cost to riders. So a 3% annually uh, increase over four years, uh, which is going to hurt ridership. Like right now we're paying around $112 a month, um, you know, for public monthly transit passes. And is that what it costs to dry, use the Calgary transit? I've never used the Calgary transit, so I can't say that's like, I like, can't fact check you on that, but is that how much it costs a month to use it? Yeah. Yeah. So a regular monthly pass for ridership is about $112. Uh, it jumped, uh, just earlier this year. And it's been slowly uh, increasing quite a bit, which uh, really impedes people's, you know, uh, affordability. It's hard to, you know, fork over that extra money. That's less money in their pocket. And now they're looking at increasing it, uh, you know, 3% annually over four years, which by the time I think they're done, it'll be just over 126, 130 some dollars a month, which, you know, just to, just to give you a little bit of background information, I moved to Toronto back in 2007. And the, at that time, in 2007, uh, Toronto Transit was $99. And even back then, uh, there was so much accessibility for public transit. The infrastructure was there to move, you know, citizens across the city at a, you know, at a reasonable. And obviously, if you live in Toronto at that time, you know, compared to where it is now, it's night and day. But, you know, compared to where Toronto was back in 2007 to where Calgary is in 20 you know, 22 is, is night and day. And to charge now $112 and looking at an increase as they are sitting around the discussion table and looking at what the, you know, they can do to, uh, to cover their costs, uh, it starts to really hurt. And then we start to looking at the environment. Well, then that'll push more people back into cars and there's more traffic on the roads and more delay times and all of that stuff. And then we have, you know, the other issues that, uh, uh, carry residents talk about when it comes to public transit is is commuting through the downtown where they feel it's it's unsafe right so there's there's a lot of uh you know uh crime that's increased because of inflation there's a lot of people hurting for their cupboards and you know and then you know uh we have a you know a growing rising uh homeless population that uh is really you know uh being unmet we've got uh, you know, it's December the, the 24th, or sorry, November the 24th, and we don't even have warming stations opened up yet. And we've already had a huge cold snap. And so those, you know, are, unfortunately, our homeless population had to suffer through that. And the city is saying it's going to be until the 1st of December before they start opening up um, warming centers, and they're not going to be 24-hour accessible. They're only going to have a couple of uh, periods through the day. Uh, which is a, a horrible Band-Aid solution for for those experiencing homelessness. So, you know, this this impacts so much. It impacts Calgary Transit because you know um, our homeless population has to go somewhere. You know, they they need to get off the the cold streets, and so you know they will come and see uh, you know the transit situation, and and uh, you know they they find warm areas, and uh, you know so there there's a lot of impacts that uh, Calgarians are feeling. Uh, that are just not being met and they're concerned. Um, you know, there's so much, you know, their NDP, for example, was recently talking about wanting to connect with Calgary and revitalizing the downtown, but no solid mention of helping uh, solve our overdose crisis and our rising homeless population. So, you know, it, it's kind of like the the uh, the Danielle Smith kind of, um, you know, epidemic where she's saying we need to do this and we need to do that, but there's no solid plan. So the Greens, you know, we, we have a plan. Uh, we do uh, care about these issues. They should be the very first thing that we tackle uh, if we're going to grow our city, if we're going to reduce crime, if we're going to, 
you know, help our residents, whether they're in Cary or Hayes or Edgemont with inflation, you know, and tackling our, our healthcare system. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot on the plate of the, and the minds of, uh, of Calgary Cary and residents and uh, all across the city. And a lot of it is obviously overlapping, but uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of serious issues. So that gives, that brings us back to the six principles of the green party of Alberta. So you, you, all three of you have mentioned a very long list of issues that are facing your residents, healthcare, inflation, education, cost of living, housing, environment, public transit, homelessness, safety, crime. How does the green party address these with the six principles that the party, I don't want to say adheres to, but as, uh, is is it adheres because, or is it the six principles that make your party the the party it is? Who wants to take that question? Don't all jump at once. It's a really good interview when there's dead silence for a podcast, guys. <laughs> Evelyn, Brandy, Jonathan. <laughs> so the so six principles. So who? So what? First off, can someone explain to me what the six principles are for those people who are listening right now? Going, what do you mean six principles? What are the six principles? So who wants to take that question before we finish the other question? Jonathan, sure, what are the six totally principles? So the first uh, six of the six principles are ecological uh, wisdom. So human beings are uh, part of the natural world, and we respect and the specific value of all life forms. And nonviolence is our second one. So we are committed to nonviolence and uh, cooperation between states, societies, and individuals. Uh, participatory democracy. And if you're on our Twitter uh, or other social media, you're, you know, or even just we're going to talk into- about participatory democracy you at the end it. of the interview. Right. You know that. Exactly. So just to give you an overview of what that means, it's uh, in a healthy democracy, all citizens have the right to express their views and are able to directly participate in the environment, economic, social and political decisions which affect their lives. Uh, so the, and the other one would be respect for diversity. Uh, so we honor all life, uh, all forms of diversity, for example, like racial, linguistic, ethnic, sexual, religious, and spiritual, within the context of individual responsibility towards beings. Uh, then we have social justice. Uh, the key uh, to social justice is uh, equitable distribution of resources to ensure that all have full personal and social development opportunities. And in sustainability, we recognize uh, the limited scope for material expansion of society within the biosphere and the need to maintain biodiversity uh, through sustainable use of renewable resources. So those are our uh, six principles that uh, guide our and, and lead and direct uh, and move our party. So how do those well, six, oh, go ahead, Brandy, sorry. I was just gonna say, and regarding kind of our adherence to that, we've kind of, deviated slightly in the sense that we have uh, put this down into three or four core uh, principles for the Green Party of Alberta. So we've segregated a little bit and simplified that. And so when we're talking about the Green Party of Alberta specifically under those six principles, we have our four S's. And that's where in Alberta, we're focusing on safe and secure communities, strong public services, sustainable jobs and economy, and saving for the future. So we we definitely follow all of the six principles, and then we have simplified that into the four S's as really our, our guiding platform for the Green Party of Alberta. So how do you do that? How does how do the four S's play into addressing the issues that you talked about that the people of your individual ridings are uh, speaking to you about, whether it be healthcare, inflation, education, so on and so forth. So how do those four S's uh, play into helping you decide how to fix issues and address issues? I don't want to say fix because fixing is not a one person job. It's a community that has to help you fix it. So how do the S's play into addressing the issues? So we think that those S principles really are kind of those actionable items within the six principles that the Green Party has. And so we think that in order to to really have safe and secure communities, uh, we have to have strong public services, we have to be saving for the future, and we have to have sustainable growth. And so we really think that those four, four 
pillars are, are what's important to make Alberta the place that we want it to be. Evelyn, do you have anything Those to add? Those four S's, yeah. Yeah, for sure. The four S's came about through a very large brainstorming exercise that Jordan and I undertook, uh, probably starting in late 2020, um, after he was elected leader. And at the time I was deputy leader, um, we looked at sort of all the information that we could find about, um, we looked at things like the Alberta Narratives Project, and we looked at what Albertans were saying they wanted in their government, in their province. And so this is how we sort of evolved um, initially it started as three P's, then it became um, three R's, and then it became four S's. Um, so it takes elements of what we continually hear from Albertans um, in terms of what are the things that are important to them. And Albertans are very value-based. And I find that this is always a wonderful way to connect to Albertans. Whether you're green or NDP or conservative, the common ground is our values as our Albertans. Um, so when I go door knock, I can connect with people who are conservative because I know what conservatives, conservative values are, and I know where the common ground is between where I am as a green and where they are as conservatives. So we find those common threads um, and we weave them into the four S's, into the four pillars um, that are how we basically explain our six principles in a more integrated and intersectional way. Because if we're trying to explain just you know, ecological wisdom without talking about social justice. Um, that's, I think, where we get these disconnects of people like, you're you're just the environment party. No, we're the environment party and we care about social justice it has to be done in an equitable way. You know, the people that are going to suffer the most from climate change are the most marginalized people. And so we can't solve climate problems. We can't solve climate change without also solving social justice problems and inequity. So all of those things are wrapped together. And I think that the four S's are a really nice way of framing it for Albertans about here are what we here's what we truly value. We value safe and secure communities and that can be interpreted in many different ways because there's not just like physical safety of communities from forest fire and floods and all the things that Albertans have gone through in the last decade um, since the big flood in 2013. Um, we have all of these things that like we need to weave into that. Like, what does it mean to have a safe and secure community? Um, that touches onto healthcare, it touches onto pandemics, it touches on all sorts of issues. So I think that's the beauty of, of that. And it allows us to open that conversation with Albertans. What does that mean to you? What would it mean for you to have sustainable jobs and economy? Tell me what that means. And then we can start to like, put together that framework of how we're going to actually accomplish this as both the, you know, the Green Party of Alberta and as a province in general. I, I so want to interject here for a second. A I, I want to follow up on that because you're talking about uh, talking to Albertans. When you're talking about these four S's with your constituents or your uh, constituents that you want to represent, are they open to this discussion? Are they open to hearing about the four S's? Are they actually willing to say, oh, you know what? We tried the UCP. We tried the NDP. Let's try something different this time. Let's not go with the same. Going back to what Jonathan said, because he comes from a different party. He, he doesn't come from a different party, but he he's worked with other parties. Now he's home with the Green Party of Alberta. So Jonathan, are people open to the discussion around these solutions that the Green Party of Alberta is putting forward with the four S's and the six principles? And I was going to say the three R's and the three P's, but that's really confusing for me when Evelyn was talking about it. But let's just go with the four S's and the six principles. Well, yeah, totally. You know, Chris, um, you know, the funny thing is when I'm engaging with, uh, you know, Calgarians, um, they already know about these, you know, uh, the four S's. They may not know them specifically as four S's, but these are values that they already hold. And, you know, a lot of them because, you know, and, and we talk about participatory democracy, uh, people are starting to move away from, um, you know, the UC you know way of looking at things or even the NDP for example you know like um, the NDP has really come short on their um, you know their push for you know climate action and uh, you know real solid plans to deal with you know some of these real life issues that Albertans and Calgarians specifically are facing so when I start engaging with um, you know colleagues or friends and people from the area 
uh, in regards to the four S's, these are things that they already have inside of them that they really, uh, you know, hold as personal values and beliefs. Uh, it's, it's just drawing it out saying, you know what, the actual, the, the Green Party of Alberta is, is one that actually encompasses all of these values as a party. It's a driving, you know, um, mechanism for the, for us as, as how we lead uh, and the way forward that we believe for for Alberta ultimately, and uh, so it's it's kind of neat to you know that they they already have these um, you know these things that matter to them these principles and and what they want to see change in the province and you know as more information comes out about the impacts of climate change or you know the solutions that aren't working that the NDP brings forward in terms of you know, uh, how we're going to beat, you know, inflation or the rising costs of living or, you know, the Liberal Party, which, you know, uh, isn't really a functioning party at the moment. But, you know, all these other parties that seem to be coming up with these solutions, they fall short. And so when we're able to have it's these so not functioning that you're actually taking candidates from them. Like, look at that. Like, that shows you, like, Zach has come over to the Green Party. And that was an interesting turnaround for that interview that I did with him. But anyway, continue, Jonathan. Yeah. yeah, you know, so it's, 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 um, you know, it's just drawing out their, their already deep held values, and letting them know that there's a party running on all of those values. And that's why I say that the party of the gaps, because sometimes, you know, when we, we eventually will talk about participatory democracy, um, you know, they will, people tend to vote for the party they think is going to beat the one that they don't want. Right. Uh, but then they find out they're short on this and, and their their plan to combat that isn't working and it, they get frustrated. Right. And so, you know, we just saw an Ontario election where 10 million eligible voters, uh, you know, uh, in the province of Ontario. And we didn't see 10 million voters come to the to the voting polls, you know, and that's what we're seeing in Alberta. Last strategic voting hasn't worked, you know, to keep out the party they didn't want. And so uh, they're starting to look at other parties and finding out hey, they actually have the values I want. So it is an actually easy conversation. They just don't know that it's the 4S. And so that's where our, that conversation comes to play. I want to talk about partition. Wow. I want to talk about PR. I was going to say partition. But I can't even say the word. That that tells you how tongue-tied mind. And we'll start with Brandy on this question. Um, your leader, the Green Party of Alberta's leader, Jordan Wilkie, has made PR, proportional representation, a key platform heading into 2023. This is the first time a major party in Alberta would be calling for the change of the electoral system. Yes, some parties have set, put it on their policy platforms, but this is the first time the leader has come out and said, if we win, if we change, we will do better for the province. Um you must be happy about this. Are you, were you shocked that this was the big thing that your leader wanted to push forward? Do you support his move for changing the way we uh, uh, vote in Alberta? Uh, so first of all, for proportional representation, I am a huge fan of that being our, our big initiative. And I would say that it's not necessarily because it's something that Albertans are crying for right now but it's because they don't know that it exists oftentimes. And I think that what we're really talking about trying to address is that huge proportion of non-voters. And I personally am finding the same thing that Jonathan is, uh, as I'm talking to Calgarians, is that there is a huge willingness to try something new. And talking to people can really sway. Uh, I've, seen a, I've seen people that have been voting conservative switch to NDP and Green Party because they have had good conversations at their door with candidates they actually feel represented by. I don't think most Calgarians are feeling the least bit represented by the people that are in legislation right now, and they they want to see a change. And so if you offer them a solution, and then we're talking about not offering just a short-term solution of elect me and I will represent you, we're saying elect me and I will not only represent you, but force Alberta legislature to continue to represent you for the rest of your life. And that's what we are really trying to sell is that Alberta's legislature does not match Albertans. And, and we wanna see that cohesiveness in, in our world because I think especially being, like I, I've been doing clean tech in Alberta for almost a decade and uh, 
like that it exists, right? Like Alberta can do these things and we can move forward on this. And there's just not that much momentum on a lot of the side of having the things that Albertans actually care about be the things that Alberta is talking about and being talked about in the news about. So I, I want to see that being represented. And, and I think that proportional representation is a tool to do that. I'm going to stick with Brandy here for a second, because I want to follow up on what you just said there. Uh, we've had her, we've heard time and time again, politicians tell us as candidates are going to do something. And then once they get elected, oh, sorry, we're not going to do it. Um, because, hey, we got elected under first past the post. So why would we try to change the system? Because we just got elected by that way. How do how do we trust the Green Party of Alberta? How do we know you're putting your words where your 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 mouth will be when you're in the legislature? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. It's just uh, I, I asked the same question to Jordan Wilkie when he sat in my studio and we I asked him the question, how do we trust you that you're going to follow through on this? I mean, that's a hard one. Uh, I think that a lot of people are really struggling to trust any politician right now. And so I, I completely understand where you're going at with that. And uh, really, it comes down to, I think that the one thing that our, our candidates like myself and Jordan and, and the people you're seeing around this table, we are trustworthy people. We have reputations. We are not people that have not built our communities for the, our entire lives. I, I have worked very hard in my life to build a community of science uh, scientists and innovators and tech developers and clean tech. And I'm not going to go and tell them something and not do it. So why would I do that to Albertans? And I would say that we really are bringing a reputation that is admirable. I, I think that Jordan's background in emergency services is amazing. I think that Jonathan's background in, in education and spiritualism and, and the journey that you've taken and Ev, your background in understanding people and humanity, we are trustworthy people. And I think that Albertans will feel that as we get our voice out. Well, thank you. And I, I apologize that you got that question. It's just you got the first question. So I was going to follow up with you, Brandy. Evelyn, PR is something that I will say, and I'm not trying to burst a lot of bubbles here, but not a lot of people are talking about. They're talking about inflation. They're talking, when I asked you about the issues that are facing, PR didn't come up. How do you make this an issue going into the 2023 election, Evelyn? Thanks for the question, Chris. So I absolutely agree with you um, in terms of PR pro rep as an issue, it probably is a demon in the top 10. Um, although I guess education about it is not where it needs to be, where people are starting to connect the dots of how they're feeling is because of this electoral system that we have first past the post. Um, so while I agree with Jordan that we move towards a PR system, I'll have to say the devil are, is in the details. And it's important for us to consider Albertans' needs with respect to PR and meet them where they're at. So I've talked to a lot of Albertans, and while many agree that they want better representation, they want to have a better system, better electoral system where their voice is heard, they want to feel represented, they don't generally want to increase the size of government. Um, and as taxpayers, they don't want to pay more government salaries, more pensions, more travel expenses, more steak dinners. So I think we need to balance those um, kind of opposing factors and come up with a system that works. Um, so if you if you bear with me for like, I'm going to try to keep this to four minutes, um, I will kind of say where I agree with Jordan and where I disagree. Um, so, so before you do of... that, I'm going to ask this question and then you can go into your four minutes. This is a unique position because you are a candidate who is disagreeing with their leader. The Green Party allows for free thought. They do not whip votes, correct? Correct. Okay, now correct. you can go into and your four have, minute. <laughs> yeah, and we have robust discussion about a lot of these issues in our candidate chat group. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of different types of PR methods that are possible. Um, so my understanding is that mixed member proportional is the most popular option across Canada in all the referendums we've had in BC, other places. So essentially voters get two ballots. Your first ballot would look exactly like we have what we have now. You vote for your local representative, your local LM MLA. The second ballot though would be a long ballot of names for each party. And that's the regional ballot or party vote. 
And this is where we would det determine what proportion of top-up seats go to which party, uh, depending on the proportion of vote they get across the region. So if Albertans don't want to increase the number of M MLAs from 87 to like, I don't know, 140, for example, um, then through this PR system, mixed member proportional, it is possible for actually us to keep the same size of constituents or same number of MLAs, we would need to increase the size of each constituency by about 67 to 70%. So these would be mega ridings that would have one MLA and then they, they would have a bunch of regional MLAs or top up seats. Um, so Scotland actually has a semi mixed member proportional system with regional ballots and they do first past the post in their local constituencies. So it's a very interesting hybrid system. Um, it's through this hybrid system that a Calgary-born MP um, called Lor Lorna Slater um, got elected on the regional ballot to the Scottish Parliament. Um, Lorna actually went to my high school, Western Canada High School in downtown Calgary. Um, and although I did not have the pleasure to know her back then, it's really nice to know that Calgary has produced a green politician somewhere in the world. <laughs> Does not hear quite yet. Uh, but maybe through a pro rep system, we would get closer to that. Um, so mixed member proportional in a system that doesn't increase in size, I think that we could make that work for Albertans. I think that if we went to the doorsteps and said, we want to increase you know, the amount of MPs or MLAs in this area, I don't think it would resonate with Albertans. So we really need to make sure that when we do go to the doorstep, we've taken account for that and we've done our research on what's going to work because I can guarantee you if you go to the average Albertans doorstep and say I want to have yeah, I want you to have better representation I want you to have two MLAs in this area instead of just one um, as taxpayers they're going to be like are you nuts we're going to have to pay for those people's salaries and their pensions and their travel budget and their housing budget this is not going to be a popular sell to a lot of Albertans who are already like as taxpayers feeling crunched um, so there's another system called Single Transferable Vote, or STV, which is a proportional ranked choice voting. So this is where you can vote for your number one party, your number two party, your number three. Um, and this, you, you would basically elect um, a group of people to represent you in your area. If, you, if your first choice gets knocked off, then your vote goes to your second choice and so on until you elect a certain number um, with percentages over 50%, I believe. Um, so again, there is a way to keep this um, system to 87 seats in Alberta. Um, these constituencies would be mega constituencies, so they'd be really, really big. Um, STV, single transferable vote, is used in Ireland, some states in Australia, and it used to be used right here in Alberta. Um, so in decades, decades ago, we used to elect um, the city council um, using um, STV. The third system that exists is a blended system. So this is the rural urban proportion, uh, proportional system, and it would be a blended system. So in this system, you would use single transferable vote in urban areas, and you would use mixed member proportional in rural areas. Um, so it's kind of an interesting system and who knows, maybe rural Alberta would be more game for that. I feel sorry for the um, candidates that run in these mega ridings in rural areas because they are already so large. Um, as you know, I think candidates in rural areas sometimes have to drive for about three days to get all their signs set up um, for an election. And if they were doing that in a mega riding, it would be days and days of work. So there's definitely things that we need to consider and we need to listen to all the voices. Um, if it's a true pro rep system, everyone needs to be on board and agree and be heard. And we need to hear the concerns of probably the more than 50% of Albertans that don't want a pro rep system. Um, so while I agree with Jordan that we need to move to a pro rep system, um, I disagree with having a referendum or a citizens assembly to determine the form of PR. I know that was something that Jordan really wanted uh, to leave it to the people to decide. I really feel like the burden should be on the politicians to do the research and clearly detail the implications for Albertans from how it affects their ballot, to how it affects their taxes, to how it affects their representation. Um, I think that for me, based on my research, I think a, an MMP, mixed member proportional system, um, would work where we combine constituencies into larger ridings. So we have a local MLA, 
and some proportion of top up seats on the regional ballot um, and without increasing the size of government significantly. So for me, that would be um, how, like a good compromise for getting better representation, uh, but also respecting the wishes of Albertans. Before I ask Jonathan the follow up to that, I want to go back to Brandy here for a second. Brandy, you just heard the four minute speech from Evelyn about the three different types of voting systems. Which one are you in favor of? Mixed member proportional, single transferable vote, or the urban rural uh, MMP still, or the yeah, no that that that's the three, yeah. I'm sorry. I uh, would have to agree with Ev, so I'm a big fan of MMP, and I also believe that there needs to be a bit of a combination on like when when we start really pushing this in Alberta, we need to have a bit of a citizens referendum. There has to be some input from from public Albertans, but there also needs to be a bunch of analysis done on the economics involved with this and how that transition happens. And we know that it's possible to not increase the size of government and not increase the cost of capital, like overall government spending for this, this type of a system. I believe it was New Zealand that had, had done a whole bunch of work recently and found that their system does not, not increase overall costs. But that needs to be done in Alberta before doing implementation. And I, I would also agree that it's not necessarily a door knocking issue, but it's an issue that people, that, that representation encompasses. And that's really what we want to be as the Green Party of Alberta. I think Jonathan's talked about it as us as being the GAPS party. Ev's talked about it in that importance in representing Albertans. And, and so we, we really want to provide that opportunity to provide real representation to our constituents and people with the same values as them. Jonathan, last follow-up, and then I'm going to ask my last question, and then we'll wrap up here. But Jonathan, you and I both lived in Ontario in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we we went to a citizens referendum in 2007 about mixed member proportional versus first past the post. Um, education was not a good thing in that election, because I remember it because I was working that election and i could tell you that a lot of people were very confused um is education a key part of this part policy platform is education the key part of any type of change to a voting intention for a provincial wide uh, mandate uh yeah you know i think you know from my time going through the ontario you know, education system, politics wasn't really brought up a lot at all, really, you know, and uh, so you have to, you <laughs> I know, right? don't yeah. agree with you on that one. Yes, I do. But anyways, right. Um, you have to learn politics on the fly, you know, and a lot of it you're drawn from, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like how faith is kind of passed on through um, your family. Like my family were, you know, uh, conservative voters and eventually just stopped voting. There was not a lot of interest there. They didn't feel represented. And, you know, there was not a lot of education from my family there. So eventually, you know, I think I'm the only one now in my, most of my entire family, even extended family that is very, you know, even relatively active in politics, meaning going out to vote, you know, and, and it, it was just, there's a lot of people that just, you know, uh, are so disconnected, you know, from, politics and it's like that in most places uh, i think across canada and and i think even here talking to people and you get you you get your political nerds that are out there and i i can definitely say i'm i'm holding that that title now uh but that wasn't something that i was born with right like uh and so you have to learn so i think education uh is definitely a really key part of it i think talking about politics and understanding the different types of political you know, systems that uh, are out there and, you know, looking at the current first past the post, you know, um, there's there's a lot of uh, ignorance around that and that it's not very democratic and people don't, you know, there's a lot of people that don't understand that. It's because it's the way we've done things, you know, for a long, so why why change it now? And, uh, you know, those, those are the people that don't really kind of pick at it and poke at it and criticize it and, and critically think about it. Uh, and then there's other people that we have, you know, look at Ontario, a giant gap of people that just didn't bother showing up. And it's because they felt politically abandoned, A, 
education, you know, B, the party that they wanted to vote for, there was no, you know, way in, you know, to them, there was just no way that they would get elected. But if they would have voted, that would have been a different story. You got, you know, 6 million people or so that didn't vote. Imagine they did, you know what I mean? So I think that they feel that there's a lack of power in their vote, which they have every right to, 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 to feel that way because there isn't any, you know, there's not really much of a power to your vote. And, you know, with first past the post. And so um, how do we regain that and make that, a, you know, a, a driving thing uh, to get people out to the polls, you know, and get them out and make make, you know, voting accessible, not just a voting station, but educationally accessible so that you're, you know, as our, you know, sixth principle would say participatory democracy. It's really important and understanding why it, you know, um, you do, there's a lot of people that do have a party out there. There is a home for a lot of our non-voters, but they just, there's a lot of um, misunderstandings and a lack of education around the whole thing. So I think that, you know, education as a whole needs to do a lot better. And I think if we took a look at our current, you know, train wreck curriculum draft that's floating around out there, uh, it's a key indication. Um, I want to turn to my very last question for all three of you, because I just realized we just hit the hour mark and I told you 45 minutes. So here we are an hour into this. Um, and this is a poignant question. And this is, I'm going to go in reverse order, starting with Evelyn, then Jonathan, and then we'll end with Brandy. Um, you all decided to put your name forwards for one reason or another. There must be an issue. There must be an issue that you believe there is a gap in this province that needs to be fixed, whether it be one of the issues you talked about with health care, whether it be inflation, homelessness. What is that issue for you? What is that issue that you want to champion if you are elected in May 2023 and have the privilege to serve in the Legislative Assembly? Evelyn, your turn. Thanks, Chris, and thank you so much for the opportunity to be on your show and speak to you again. Um, for me, there isn't one issue that I would say I would want to champion. I think it's more um, that I want to champion what I want to see in politics, which is political courage. I think it needs to be the political courage to make hard decisions, to make unpopular decisions, to stand up to powers that are really trying to move Alberta in a really bad direction. Um, I think we need politicians that are gonna be willing to put their reputations on the line and say, I will not do this. I will not hurt people anymore. So I think for me, that's what it is. Thank you, Evelyn. Jonathan, what about yourself? What is the issue that you want to champion if elected in May? Yeah, you know, I have to echo Evelyn a lot in what she said, and I, I, it's hard to narrow down just one issue, but if I could narrow it down, it would be really two main ones. And I think it, first of all, it would go to our, you know, our, our homeless population, you know, from Lethbridge, Calgary, across to Edmonton and all the corners and the, the spaces between. Um, I think that we have the ability to solve homelessness uh, and, and just poverty. Poverty is legislated. It can be fixed easily, but as Ev was, you know, pointing out that we're missing at the legislature is the political will, and it, you know, for a lot of them, it's just not something that to them is going to get votes. So it's not a popular topic for them, and they get pushed down to the bottom, you know. And we need to end this. This is twenty twenty three. We're at the door knocking here, and we need to solve this. It is solvable. We can fix it. And I think the other main issue for me is education. You know, we have an education system that is underfunded. Uh, you know, the UCP removed the title from, you know, the boards public. They don't want them public. They want to cripple it, just like healthcare. They want to make it private. And you have to campaign your dollar for it. And I think Albertans are in desperate need of one publicly funded education system, you know, fully funded and, uh, you know, with a, a robust uh, curriculum a curriculum that is inclusive and embraceive and diverse and uh, offers choice, accessible choice. You know, when we split the dollar, then we lose the opportunity for Albertans to get access to vital uh, programs that our education system used to and, and still could 
offer every person without having to spend extra out of their own pocket. And so we need to get there and we can get there. And, uh, you know, so education is a huge one for me, as well as, you know, looking after marginal communities such as our homeless population uh, are the two driving factors for me. Thank you, Jonathan. And Brandy, to end on you, what is the issue that you want to champion? What is the issue or situation that you believe you can bring forward to the legislature that hasn't been addressed yet? That is a hard question. Uh, so I, I would say for, for me, a lot of what drove me into politics and the reason that I really started getting involved was my background in, in clean energy and, and building technology and, and that kind of side and just seeing how much policy impacts all of that. Uh, but, but that's not necessarily what drove me to run. Uh, so the reason that I, I'm going for nomination is really because I think in in all of that, as I'm watching uh, growing up in Canada, I had so much privilege that I didn't understand that I see actually being dragged back. And, and I don't understand the reasoning for that. And as far as I can tell, there is none. And, and I want to see that change. And when I'm talking about privilege like that, I'm talking about the supports that I had, like access to health care that wasn't an issue access to education. Uh, I grew up in rural Manitoba. We had a fully functioning education system. I had all the criteria to be able to go to university. University was affordable enough for me to go to. And, and that has allowed me to, to get into a career path that has been so much fun. And I'm very privileged to have had that. And I recognize that I wouldn't have had that if I weren't Canadian. And I've seen a lot of my friends that are immigrants, my friends that are uh, racially diverse struggle in, in ways that they shouldn't have to, and I'm sick of seeing it. Uh, so I, I really believe that Canada can do better, and Canada has done better, and that there needs to be policies in place that are supporting us uh, when it comes to, to things across science innovations and our ability to develop COVID vaccines and things like that that have we used to have and have been taken away. And, and so, yeah, I, I'm seeing a degradation in the quality of life in Canada that I really think needs to be addressed. And we should be able to support people from other nations and bring things up. And, and we're making immigrant life terrible in Canada. And, and that just needs to be addressed. And, and so there's just a whole bunch of factors where I see a lacking in our ability as Canadians to support where we used to. And so, yeah, that, that's really what brought me here. Well, thank you so much, Brandy. Um, Brandy, Jonathan, Evelyn, it has been a pleasure to sit down with you for the last hour to ch chat about the issues that are facing Albertans, the issues that are facing Calgarians, the Green Party of Alberta, your candidacy. Um, for those who are listening and watching this, the links to Brandy, Jonathan, and Evelyn's social media feeds, the ones that I can find besides TikTok, because anyone who listens to the show knows I despise TikTok and I will never promote it, even though I talk about it so much. But any ones that I can find will be linked in the show notes. So check them out. If you have any questions, if you live in Calgary Edgemont, Calgary Curry, and Calgary Hayes, reach out to these candidates because you need to ask them questions. You need to get involved. You need to get informed and you need to be educated before May, 2023 and vote, get out and vote, vote, vote. I'm going to say that a lot in May, but or a lot in 2023, but here we are start getting educated now. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode. Put down social media. I know you just said, go follow them on social media, but put down social media and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, helps our society, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. With that, this has been the very last full episode of the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown for 2022. Tomorrow, we will be joined with by the leader of the Green Party of Alberta, Jordan Wilkie, for our first episode of our 2022 year in review please tune in for that uh greatly appreciate it all three of you and everyone have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone keep talking mm -hmm.